By the time Washington and the remnant of his army were able to put the Delaware between themselves and the British, uh, his men were, were demoralized, they were ragged, uh, uh, many of them were short of shoes because of, of having to travel long distance at, at, at speed. Uh, Washington's uh, entire administrative machinery was in disarray, uh, and things looked very grim for the common soldier. George Washington, in the imagination of most Americans, is the ultimate American of the 18th century. It's difficult for us to imagine him being anything except eloquent, successful, and famous. But in 1776, that didn't look to be the case on any of those points. For one thing, having taken command of the Continental Army and successfully compelled the surrender of Boston in 1776, from that point onwards, almost everything went downhill for Washington. The Continental Army was very embarrassingly beaten at Long Island. Washington himself was frustrated with the Continental Army, with its lack of discipline, with the poor quality of the volunteers who were involved, and especially of its militia auxiliaries. And he was further disheartened by the political infighting in Congress. Not only were the states in Congress putting more energy into fighting with each other than fighting the British, but Washington was frequently singled out as one of the people to be caught in the crossfire. And by December of 1776, with his army hemorrhaging deserters, with the British looking like they had pretty well come close to wrapping up the entire business of this revolution, Washington stood a real good chance of going down as the um, ultimate, shall we say, losing pitcher of the 18th century. Well, as the British and the Hessians uh, advance into New Jersey, they're so carried away by, by the certainty of victory that they forget that their job is not just to kill rebel soldiers, but to win back hearts and minds. And so they start looting. They start helping themselves. And there are also widespread reports of rape and also occasional reports of murder when, when New Jersey men try to protect their women folk. Though English-born, uh, Thomas Paine was one of the most radical revolutionaries in America. Uh, he's a printer by trade, but he's going to uh, accompany Washington's army as a volunteer aide. He's going to be present during the retreat. And uh, as the Americans uh, approach uh, Pennsylvania, he decides, he, I mean, he can tell that morale is falling apart. He decides something has to be done, as he put it, to reanimate uh, the country. Well, Rawl, like other Hessian officers, he looked with contempt on his American enemies. First of all, since they were rebels in his eyes, he thought of them in the same way that Americans today would view terrorists, would view Al-Qaeda. And then secondly, in actual combat, he and his troops had mastered Washington and his half-trained Continentals time and again. Uh, the bravery and the bayonets of, of his grenadiers had won the day at White Plains and had carried the American entrenched positions at Fort Washington. So when Rawl reaches Trenton and his officers say, shouldn't we fortify this outpost? He says, no, if the rebels come, we'll just give them the bayonet. General, we are at your service. I think the men that, that followed Washington to Trenton, they were the hardcore. I mean, thousands had deserted, uh, but this was the faithful remnant. Uh, whether they believed in Washington or not when they crossed the Delaware, I think something of his, of his resolution, uh, the fact that he was with them, uh, that he was leading from the front, I, I think that must have had an impact on their thinking, and it enabled them to put their trust in him uh, at least one more time. It's often said that no military plan ever survives the first contact with the enemy. Well, Washington's plan started to come unraveled even before contact. For one thing, the two militia components of his attack plan that were supposed to stage these diversionary uh, uh, attacks on, uh, on the Jersey side of the Delaware never got across the river. 
So that didn't happen. Then it was the slowdown of getting across the Delaware in the teeth of the storm. It was proceeding on the roads. Nothing seemed to be going according to timetable. And if Washington had gone strictly by that, then he might very easily have abandoned the entire operation. One of the real miracles of the crossing is that no uh, American troops or cannon or any other uh, equipment belonging to the Army uh, was lost in the actual crossing. And that's a tribute to the organizational skills and the energy and abilities of, of Henry Knox. Uh, the accelerating current made it difficult to get across and get boats back uh, to reload, and that's going to slow things down. Washington hoped to have everybody uh, on the New Jersey shore uh, by midnight. His army is not going to be ready to march until 4 a.m., which was one hour before he planned to hit Trenton. So that means he's going to be hitting the, the, the Germans uh, at daylight. Washington's spirit seemed to um, take possession of his army. As they're marching uh, toward Trenton and this snow and sleet's coming down, his officers tell him that uh, the men won't be able to fire their weapons. There's water in, in the priming pans of the rifles and the muskets. And Washington t tells them, well, then we will just use the bayonet. And when they get to Trenton, they do that. They are willing to close with an enemy who had defeated them repeatedly with the enemy's preferred weapon with cold steel. Johann von Rahl shared his superiors, Carl von Dunnop's contempt for the Americans. That doesn't mean, as it's often suggested, that the Hessians were caught unawares. In some accounts, we can read that you know, the Hessians have been having quite a heavy party on Christmas Day, and on the morning of the 26th, uh, were too entirely drunk out of their minds and gone blotto to be able to respond to the American attack. That, in fact, is not true. The Hessians had outposts out, and they had pickets out and patrols out. There had been warnings, and at least four warnings, that came to Johann von Rahl on December 25th and through that evening. Two deserters from Washington's army showed up with messages that Washington was on the move. Uh, a local loyalist had sent von Rahl a note. Another farmer named Wall had informed Rahl that he believed that Washington was making an attempt against him. But von Rahl, even though he did the due diligence, also just didn't take it all that seriously. I mean, what army in its right mind would attempt a maneuver like that in the teeth of a nor'easter gale? And what's more, von Rahl was simply contemptuous of the Americans. His response when he garrisoned Trenton at the very beginning, a, a place he found to be nothing more than just some little lickspittle provincial village, scheisse by scheisse, he exclaimed, that's what the place is. I won't try to translate that. And when the messages came to him on December 25th and into the morning of the 26th, warning about the near approach of the Americans, von Rawls' reply to one of them was, let them come. It was not drink, celebrating, unpreparedness that undid the Hessians. It was sheer overconfidence. They had underestimated, and von Rahl in particular had underestimated what Washington and the Continentals were capable of doing under these circumstances. Good Soldaten, my Soldaten, Gerechtstein. When Washington meets with Rawl, he, he's very considerate. Uh, Rawl asks that his men are well taken care of. And Washington decides, uh, well, even before he met Raleigh, he probably decided that was what he was going to do because he not only wanted to win a victory, but he also wanted to place the Patriot cause on the moral high ground. We do not behave like barbarians. We treat our prisoners according to the rules of war. Washington is playing now to the international community because he realizes, like other far-sighted American leaders, if we're going to win we need foreign help. Washington wins his victory at Trenton. And two days afterwards, uh, a bunch of uh, Pennsylvania militiamen, uh, the Pennsylvania Associators under uh, Colonel John Cadwallader, 
they cross the Delaware because they had missed uh, the first Battle of Trenton and, and they wanted to win some glory. And Washington decides, well, I've got to go back over there to support these fellows and there might be some opportunities. But his army has only been recruited for one year. These men who have gone through hell and finally given America a victory, their uh, enlistment is due December 31st. And who's to blame them for saying, I've done my bit, I'm going home, let somebody else risk their necks. Washington begs his, his veteran Continentals to stay six more weeks. Your country is at stake. Your wives, your houses, and all that you hold dear. Cornwallis gathers his forces. Something about Washington's words. Somehow eloquence came to his rescue unbidden at that moment when it had to. One of his officers asked him, shall I enroll the men? No, said Washington. Men who would respond this way do not need to be enrolled. From there, the road lay to Princeton and victory. Lord North's government had been riding on such a tide of confidence and with such assurances from Sir William Howe that the military part of the war was just about ready to be wound up, that the attack on Trenton and the battle at Princeton came as a palpable shock in Parliament. It was almost as though North's government had been exposed as the basest form of liars. The unhappy North, of course, had not planned it that way. He had been perfectly sincere in the promises that he'd issued. But at the same time, it made him look like an idiot. It made Washington look like a genius. It made America look suddenly very much like a bucket the British had put their foot into. And it dispelled all the confidence that the British had had that their army could not be beaten by this ragtag collection of Americans in their hunting shirts and their long rifles. Now, suddenly, the Americans appeared formidable. And confidence that this war was going to come to some quick, easy, and bloodless conclusion evaporates in Parliament. And from that moment until Yorktown in 1783, confidence in the North administration ebbs. Every vote that is taken on an American-related issue shows fewer and fewer votes behind the North government, until finally, after Yorktown, North throws his hands in the air and says, it is all over. But that process really began at Trenton and at Princeton in that winter of 1776. The high mark of Yorktown stands at the top of a hill a hill that had to be climbed all the way from the lowest point at Trenton and Princeton, but it is a long, upwards, and uninterrupted, triumphant march. All of that began with Trenton. All of that began with Princeton. And afterwards, many a British commentator and even Hessian observers writing in their diaries reflected backwards and said, the beginning of the loss of America was at Trenton, was at Princeton in that dire winter of 1776 to 77.